Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Um, and to all of you tuning in to join us, my name is Diana Kramer, and I serve as the Interim Executive Chief of Staff at Eugenio Maria de Ostos Community College. And I have the pleasure today of welcoming you all to our first Velada Ostosiana, Ostos Culture Talk of the fall 2021 semester. Uh, and I, before I begin, I would like to just share, there is a live transcript available, closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. If you do need it, you can activate it by clicking the button. And also our event this afternoon will be recorded. Uh, just keep that in mind and know that a published uh, recording will be on our YouTube page in approximately one week from today. Uh, for those of you that may need the refresher, our Veladas Ostosianas, the Ostos Culture Talks, are a vehicle to promote opportunities to share culture, current events, artistic and literary gatherings and discussions around health, education, and cultural issues that have relevance to the Ostos family and to the communities that we serve. Today, we are joined by an award-winning author and poet, Professor Stephen Parlato, who has worked in Freshwater, Peregrine, and other journals. He is a professor of English and drawing at Naugatuck Valley Community College in Connecticut, and is also a novelist with two books, The Namesake and The Precious Dream, which are both in print. Uh, today, he will be sharing a number of collages as well as a few poems with us. And the series he has been working on most recently is called They Are Not Disposable. One of the set of the poems that he will be sharing with us is called Ayana's Braids, and it will also be accompanied by a collage that he has been working on. Professor Parlato will also be sharing the significance of these collages and their creation throughout his presentation. Uh, and he also has a website, if you wish to follow him online, at stephenparlato.com and also on Twitter with a handle of at Parlato Writes. I now turn it over for our president to bring you greetings, Dr. Daisy Coco de Filipis. Good afternoon, buenas tardes, uh, Ostos family. I'm so happy to have the presence of one of my absolute favorite professors ever. And I watch uh, Steve Parlato uh, grow uh, as, a, as, a, as, as a faculty member. But I want to tell you that what he did, whatever he touches, turns to gold in this regard. He was assigned to be the faculty advisor. Actually, I, I think I approach him in the parking lot and I said, Steve, would you do this? Uh, Juleka Lantigua had left to move to, uh, to Washington. And, uh, and he took over as the, as the, uh, the, the, the student advice, uh, advice to the paper, the Tamarack. The Tamarack went on to win awards every year under Steve's guidance. What they did was that they used the paper to support social justice issues in significant ways. And students felt, and they invited some staff and faculty as well to write, but it all had to do with very, very um, thoughtful and articulate and powerful communications. I would mention the name of one of our students I've just mentioned without mentioning her name, one he mentored. This is a lovely young woman uh, who came to the college taking remedial English and just happened to go into one of Steve's classes. And Steve, uh, not only did Steve encourage her and her writing, he actually gathered her talent. So she ultimately graduated having become the editor-in-chief of the Tamarack, then went on to Wesleyan with a full scholarship, but she also edited, was the editor of the paper, I believe, and she's now at Sarah Lawrence for her master's, again, uh, on a scholarship and doing really well. She shared with me this semester, her teacher's comments about her intellect and her maturity, and I was so, so grateful uh, to do that. I just don't want to take away from the fact that Steve comes from a manufacturing family and he chose to teach and he chose to write and you see the art, see his art behind him as well. So uh, multi-talented, but above all, a person with the most beautiful heart 
that I mean, it is amazing to me uh, what the kindness it demonstrated in the school that was becoming a majority minority at that point. Uh, Steve was there for the students, whatever, whatever race, whatever gender, whatever. Uh, he was a teacher who accepted them all and made them all shine. He won awards and we had really a good time presenting his books, The Namesake and The Precious Dreadful, uh, uh, and also hearing his poetry and seeing his poetry recognized in multiple venues as well. So I'm going to be quiet because I'm gushing a lot. But I can tell you that I am so, so grateful that he made time today, uh, at the beginning of the semester practically, to join us, to share. And I, as I said to him, I invite him to come meet his family at Ostestown as well. Welcome. Bienvenido, Steve. Thank you so much, President DeFilippis. Um, Daisy, I, I have to say, um, I so appreciated the support when you were here and that that support is, is in, in the Bronx at Ostos and, and that I've been welcomed as part of the family is really meaningful. The, um, the student that you referred to, um, I have to also give credit to my colleagues who first recognized her brilliance, um, Brian Good and Julia Pettifrere, another of, of my favorite people in the world. Um, and, and I just have to say the Tamarack um, was a huge experience in my life. And I learned and grew as much from it, I think, as any of the students. And um, it was a privilege to, to be the faculty advisor and to welcome students to, to lift their voices and to, to call for change and to point out problems in the world. And, and I think that as creative artists, we're at our best when we do that, when we answer that call to create work in response to things that we recognize as Beautiful, yes, but also things that we recognize as wrong and things that we recognize that need to change. So um, I thank you both for the kind welcome. And I'm, I'm excited to share my work. Um, I, I, I had a student come in to meet with me this morning before class and I kind of apologized to her, first of all, because my office is always messy. But then I said, I'm not so much of an egomaniac that I am surrounded by my own work all the time because I have my artwork all around me. I said, I'm doing a presentation this afternoon. Otherwise I would not have all of this, you know, my own work around me. But I did, um, I made a point of bringing the two books so the namesake and the precious dreadful. And yes, um, I still have the fondest memories of the events that your president hosted um, in support of my work. So today I, I would like to share some poetry and um, the poetry that I write, the work that I write, a lot of times people, I think, think it's at odds with who I am as a person because I'm, I'm a happy person and I'm a, a friendly person and I tend to write rather dark work. And I think that that is because I do respond to that call, you know, based on things that are troubling me, I create. So I'm part of a poetry group called Poets for the Planet. And we have um, since well before the pandemic been writing poems in my, my overhead light just went on. It was a whole new day in here for a moment. <laughs> writing poems in response to the climate crisis. And throughout the pandemic, we have continued meeting monthly just about and, and sharing our work. So I have a few poems that I have written in response to the gravity of the situation, you know, that affects all of us and, and impacts our earth. Um, the first one is titled, Once There Were Rabbits. Once there were rabbits. Daffodil heads press between fence slats like wee blonde cows swaying. As I pass, weeping cherry flings her confetti, shimmering the gutter pink. But down our street, neighbors meringue their lawn, gray swirls crushing tender stems, sealing violets beneath concrete. The park is still, the lone signs of life, some predator's debris. Beside a feather mound, a crow's severed head, eyes unglinted. Once there were rabbits studying these jade slopes, swift brown bounders, they'd freeze at my approach, then melt into cattail grasses or blueberry scrub. All gone now. 
past the playground, a ruined oak, hollow trunked, spills takeout trash. Under the bent pine, hypodermics and condom foils sparkle. Helen Keller claimed, there is beauty in everything. So when I spot the cottontail, black top splayed beyond the bend past Arbor Street, I choose to see not splintered ribs, but strips of lace, and by her side, a scatter of garnets. The next poem is sort of a vision of what might be. It's called Future World. Run your fingers through sand pattern, and you are certain to tickle shell leather. Lift her, this wee hatchling, gently in your grained palm, guiding her to surf. Now, brush those crystals free in the mane of that young antelope as his breath pools in amber beads against your neck. The mangoes are calling to you, dearest, dripping their sugar notes from each tree. Do you hear them? There, just before the horizon's purple dip, a beluga flashes white through icy sea, while behind you, 12,000 roseate spoonbill chatter lift into sapphire. Fields of caterpillars are singing tonight their wild jadeite chorus. Listen, will you watch with me for the kiss of fox in flight, their brief bronze arc at sunset? This is the always, the vast everlast, the meant to be. But please, use caution exiting your cart. Mind the gap and remember to turn your VR goggles to the gray bin. And the last of the, the poems um, kind of takes us from the climate and, and into the pandemic. Um, so that sort of intersection of those two grave things. It's called Daily Reckonings in Plague Season. He's measured these months, first in wild onions, next drained gin jugs and black lives. Matters both inconsequential and grave. Circling East Mountain, Prospect Park, forever tracking his steady accumulation of steps and prayerful decades, he numbers flame gold finch, traces erratic paths of chipmunks. He's drawn to patterns, pairings, sequences he sees. Prone to cheating, were there really 20 lightning bugs? He seeks safety, in numbers, but sometimes figures betray him. 87 refrigerated trucks, Mamie counting young Emmett's pretty teeth. Then he finds solace in a single doe. So that poem also kind of acts as a bridge into this next group of poems. And Diana mentioned that I would be sharing poems that are related to the artwork behind me. And so I do, I want to introduce those by way of talking a little bit about the process. And President De Filippis mentioned um, my sabbatical and a huge gift of sabbatical and oddly sabbatical during a pandemic became kind of a gift. The isolation of, of being at home most of the time really created a perfect opportunity for a very fertile work time for me. Um, as you all are aware, some major things happened during the pandemic um, unrelated to our, our isolation because of COVID-19. And the, the most major, the murder of George Floyd. And so wanting to speak out wanting to do something, but being reluctant to go out and join the marches because of, of COVID, um, I, I felt the need to really create something. And, and I no longer had the Tamarack as an outlet because um, I, I was finished by that point. And I had this realization um, that I could create something in response. I had been thinking about creating collages using um, 
salvaged materials. And, and I thought that they would be climate-based, ecological collages in some way, but George Floyd's murder sparked something in me. And it happened to be on Breonna Taylor's birthday that I had this realization that I, I wanted to pay honor. And so I created this first collage on Breonna Taylor's birthday. And it is crafted using basically um, junk, stuff that we would ordinarily throw away, throw away a to-go container lid, um, some packaging from a, a baking mix, some used wrapping paper as the background, some ribbon. And, and I created this, this piece and I thought, okay, I did this thing and I posted it on Facebook. And then it took on a life of its own. And I realized that I was kind of being called to create this series. So the series is called They Are Not Disposable. And when I finish it, um, I'm not sure when that end date will be, there will be 16 portraits of Black Americans whose lives were stolen because of racial violence. Um, you can see in each of the portraits, there is the first initial of the subject. And when all 16 of them are created and lined up, they will spell out the declaration Black Lives Matter. And so as a poet, I also started creating poems that connect with the um, collages. And let's see how fancy I can be. I want to share the screen right now. And there is a, a slide from a PowerPoint presentation that I did when I came back from sabbatical. And on this slide, um, you will see, oops, I just went to the next slide. So see, I can't be super fancy. This is why I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and go back and find that again. This is why I do not use PowerPoint slides in class <laughs> because I'm not a techie sort of person. Let's see if I can find my way back to our meeting. Here we are. Let me share the screen again. So the screen has um, seven collages. And that, that was what I had completed at the time that I did my sabbatical presentation. And it also has the first of the poems, which is kind of the introduction to the series. So I will read that poem and you, you can follow along if you like. Um, all right. Hosting the Stolen. For Brianna, Tamir, Cynthia, Rayshard, all the rest. Lacking the melanin required for membership, I have become host to meetings of the stolen. With no preset time or day, they come to me late and early, straight from drive through lanes and snow scudded city parks, from Bible circles, from sleep tangled sheets from family visits to the treacherous Jim Crow South. Navigating the fields of judgment, river of lies, they line my squat couch to share their aspirations, their daily joys, daughter dancing, skittles and sweet tea, their undoings. Laying down the weapon of my whiteness, I follow each doomed soul into the reeds of sorrow, knowing I must emerge alone, must ready to welcome the next. So just before I stop sharing, um, let me introduce you to the seven subjects. So I'll start at the top, and this is Ayanna Monet Stanley Jones, who was just 10 years old when she was murdered by police who were searching for a murder suspect and burst into her apartment, the incorrect apartment. The next, um, going clockwise, is Medgar Evers, um, the, the civil rights activist. Following Medgar Evers is Elijah McLean, and there is a poem dedicated to Elijah that I'll read in just a moment. Um, below Elijah is Rayshard Brooks, and then Cynthia Graham Hurd, who was a member of the Charlottesville Nine who were murdered in a Bible study class. Tamir Rice, an 11-year-old boy um, killed in a park by police, and then Brianna Taylor. So I'm gonna stop sharing, and now I will take you through um, some of the poems. I have, um, I think, five poems here to share. The first one is, um, a poem for Brianna Taylor. 
And in this poem, um, I think it's it's fairly self-explanatory, but just a little context, it is um, a docent at a museum speaking. The title, which is a run on run in title is The White Docent Walks Us Through the New Tailor Wing. The white docent walks us through the new tailor wing at the Museum of the Brutally Taken. The exhibit houses a permanent display of her relics, EMT attire, yellowed spray of blooms, notes from Jamarcus, her reputation, all splayed bare behind plates of cratered glass. The walls you'll note are draped in purple, draped in floral spools of satin befitting the tombs of the royals. A special section is devoted to her shoes, but first, please do pause to study this small jeweled reliquary. Through the crystal lid, you'll plainly see eight bullets, artfully arranged on a field of velvet, meant to evoke a single daisy. Here in the main gallery, our most hallowed piece, yes, her bed sheet, how it's been transformed by her blood, the gun scorch, why it's practically a Turin shroud. Squinting, we swear we almost see Brianna's face. The next poem is titled Footprints in Snow. Elegy for Tamir Rice. In drifted fields, my mind spirals, leaping to that child's footprints in November snow, circling labyrinthine as he ducks and points. Can you hear his laughter? A broken toy gun. Oh, to slow time, to halt the skidding cruiser, seize the fatal bullet from its chamber, freeze this moment in autumn ice. Oh, to rewind that day back, back before the gazebo, before the blood, reroute his steps back to the rec center potter's wheel, crochet table, to undo the fateful swap of phone for gun, to keep him safe. But being a boy and just 12, of course he answers the gun's siren call. Boys always, despite mother's warnings, answer. Once our son's friend Michael, barred from play weapons, gnawed his toast into a pistol, pointing, pow, powing it at breakfast. They praised him for resourcefulness, that blue-eyed, freckled boy. But this gone child? They say his blackness, his bigness at just 12, sealed his fate. They blame him for giving that white cop cause to shoot. So I don't know if you all are familiar with the details of Tamir's story, but he was at the, the park rec center and had traded his cell phone for a toy gun with a friend. And it was reported that there was um, someone in the park pointing a gun. Um, and it was, I forget how many seconds between the time the police barreled in in their car, threw the door open and, and shot Tamir, um, but it was no more than a couple of seconds. Um, and. So in the poem, you know, and not to explain the poem to you because hopefully the poem does its work, but this disparity that we see so often in society um, where a white child might not have been perceived as a threat and because of the color of a child's skin and his supposed largeness for, for 12, um, he becomes a target. The next poem is, is the poem um, for Elijah McLean. And just a little bit of background if you don't know Elijah's story. Um, and I'm sure that many people do because his, his story became very famous, went very viral. Um, the Aurora, Colorado police apprehended him as he walked home from a convenience store. Um, he had a condition which caused him to always feel cold. And so he was wearing a face mask 
very ironic that we're all wearing masks now. Um, if this had happened, you know, maybe if a, a bit later in time, maybe Elijah would still be with us. Um, his last words, which I will paraphrase because I don't have them memorized, his last words were um, that he was just a little bit different and that he, he was really trying and that despite the way that he was being brutalized by the police who had him on the ground and in restraints, that he loved them. And, and he was really trying to be a good person. One of the ways in which Elijah succeeded at being a good person was that he volunteered at an animal shelter and he played his violin for the cats there to calm them. So this poem is, um, it's not really written in the voice of the cats, but it is, it's the perspective of the cats kind of. It's called Shelter Cats Mourn for Elijah McLean. The old Abyssinian clears her throat her whiskers flick, impatient, as kittens dart weave in eager rows. They've coaxed her into sharing their favorite fable, the one about the black angel, and how he poured his music through cage mesh, his melodies kissing temple tufts, caressing silk backs, soft as gauze felt, mouse cheeks. His tunes were shields for Stray's ears, softening the sharp buzz clank of armored doors, soothing the hissing mule of new arrivals. Too young, too new to have known his bright thereness, they shiver still in his ever absence, wondering at the cold silence of his lost violin. So just to, I'll, I'll share a, a little closer the collage of Elijah. And I like to talk about the materials that I use to, to create the portraits, which are all um, recycled materials. So in the portrait of Elijah, um, there, there is some cardboard from packaging. His shirt is made from um, a reed a reed diffuser box um, that, I, that I had gotten for Christmas, a, a reed diffuser. And I just loved the pattern. Um, and it, it sort of evoked something that Elijah was wearing in one of the photos of him that I studied. Um, he has his earbuds in because music was very important to him. And, and so he always tended to have his earbuds um, and his glasses. One thing that's missing from the portrait, I had all along as I was creating it, um, and, and I do tend to learn about the person. I want to portray the person's life, not just the tragedy of their death. So I feel like on, on a certain level, I get to know them and I, I form a connection with them. And I have to tell you, the, the portrait of Elijah was, was very emotional to create. Um, because I did learn about him. And you know, when I, when I would put a fleck of light in an eye and have the realization that those who truly knew and loved him are missing him on this much deeper level. Um, anyway, I, I had wanted to incorporate a piece of sheet music just as you know, a highlight. Um, he needs a highlight on his cheek. And I could not find sheet music in our um, home. And I was looking through magazines to see if I could find any. And this, this piece and the, the portrait of Ayana, um, they were part of an exhibit here in Connecticut over the summer. And so I framed them without the sheet music. And then I was out walking. I've been walking since last July. I had been walking up to 11 miles a day. It's good contemplative creative time. Um, I've, I've lost some weight along the way, which was good. Um, and I found a piece of sheet music on the ground. And initially I spotted it and I was like, holy cow, that is sheet music. I need that for my collage. And then my next instinct was, I don't want to pick that up <laughs> because there's a pandemic. And then I was like, you fool, the universe is sending you a piece of sheet music. Pick that up and use it. So I have it at home and I have yet to incorporate it. It's going to become a highlight on Elijah's cheek. Um, but you know, thinking about the, the concept of the series and the way that these lives have not been valued in the way that they should, um, you know, it, it seems appropriate to me that the materials that I'm using are materials that we would ordinarily throw out. 
Um, the final poem that I will read, it is a series of um, four, yes, four loose sonnets. Um, and this one is, it accompanies the portrait of, of Ayanna Monet Stanley Jones. Her portrait um, fell off my easel today and the glass is broken. So I will have to put a new piece of glass, but fortunately she's okay. I'm sure you can't really see um, online, but her braids, um, my wife taught me to crochet a while back and I, I've made a few scarves. That's, that's all I can manage, but I crocheted Ayanna's braids. Um, so I, I mentioned that because it's referenced in the poem. The poem is titled Ayana's Braids. To start, a disclaimer. There is no room, no space, no place for that cop's expert lies. His yarn spun round Myrtilla, sticky as any web. Nor for the lawyer, his gall to call a racked grandmum's testimony show, to brand her fool. You will not find that TV crew, lenses eager to capture reality. One more little black girl murdered. This space is sacred. I claim just a slim slice for my white self as crafter of images, grief chronicler. This poem belongs to them, those mothers, grandmothers, violently unchilded. Now a question. Will you dare enter the depths of Black grief? Two, picture a skein of Black grief. Unspooling, it would entwine the earth ten times, braiding continent to continent, a poison shawl, an inky shroud. In the video, the white yarning expert reminds me, all crochet projects start with making a chain. Fingering soft black fibers, I summon the whisper cries of the taken. Black tears in the blackness of ship's holds, chain bloodied ankles, wrists. Black mothers draped like wailing blankets across small pink coffins. The five millimeter hook slips. I am finger clumsy, chaining threads to craft Ayana's braids. I need them perfect as Myrtilla's. Three, Myrtilla's fingers were nimble, careful not to tug Ayana's braids that, never suspecting it would be her last morning. Sweet girl in a kitchen chair, maybe she ate waffles, pinkies maple sticky. Grief owns that kitchen now. Squatting by the stove, it scrapes painted peonies off the good teacups, crushing all but one to bone dust. At midnight, grief glows ferocious, a flash grenade capsizing the front porch, shrieking the living room walls with rage. Her scorched couch submerged in a sea of tears. Myrtilla sinks. Far from shore, her wails summon, call back, to Alberta, to Mamie, the countless. Four. And they answer. Each voice a separate strand in an endless braid, each cry lifting her, inviting her to join the infinite chorus of the left behind. Myrtilla Keens for her taken love, her bullet-robbed Ayana, and the great harmonic swell rises, a grief scream ululation that cloaks the sun, eclipses the earth in black grief. Imagine an Afghan crocheted from black grief. Fields after fields of granny squares in the most sumptuous hues. Strong black yarn would flow through those fields like blood through black veins. Blocking the stars, that Afghan would reduce the vast universe to one grief draped couch. And that is all that I have to share with you as far as the poetry. I have one more, well, I have two more. I have one other finished collage. Um, 
I had mentioned to Diana yesterday as, as we chatted a bit to prepare for today, one of my goals is to um, show the diversity of lives lost within the Black community. And so, as I mentioned, I have Medgar Evers, you know, to sort of show some of the historical span. Um, Tamir and Ayana, children, Cynthia Graham Hurd, you know, probably an age contemporary of, of me, someone in her 50s. This is um, Tatiana Hall, a Black trans woman who was murdered um, for being both of those things, for being Black and transgender. And as, as we know, or maybe some of us are not aware, um, violence toward the, the trans community and the trans community of color in particular is, is an epidemic. Um, last I looked, which was a few months ago, around 40, 45 trans women had been murdered, trans women of color this year. Um, it, it's, it's a larger number than all of last year. Um, and this was, I think in July, I was looking at some of the statistics as I was reading Tatiana's story and, and learning about her. So um, yeah, this one, some of the materials, um, you know, the, the wrapping paper, that is the most of the background of Brianna's piece finds its way into each of the collages. So there are little bits of it to sort of unify things. Um, and packaging and some, some other wrapping paper. Um, a little bit more of, I think, a to-go container to make those metallic earrings. But I wanted to show you one other image. And this is one that I'm currently working on. And sadly, I've already missed two deadlines. Um, India Kager was killed on September 5th of 2016. Um, she was with her boyfriend. They were introducing their three-month-old baby to his family. They were no longer actually a couple, but she had gone with him to Maryland to introduce their baby to his extended family. And the police had received a tip that he was in Maryland um, to commit a crime. And so they surveilled this couple throughout the day they had to be aware that the couple had a baby in a car seat because India frequently left the car to bring the baby in and out. Um, they were in a parking lot at a 7-Eleven when a SWAT team blew into the parking lot, rammed their car, and almost immediately opened fire, um, killing the two adults, um, fortunately not physically injuring the baby. Um, he had a, a scratch or two from broken glass. Um, he was then whisked away and into Child Protective Services. So his, his grandmother had no idea what had happened to this baby when she received the news that her daughter was murdered. Um, her first question was, where is my grandson? And no one could tell her, or really no one would tell her, I think is the truth of the matter. India was a, a Navy veteran. And so the collage that I'm working on right now um, is, is taken from a photo of her in her, her dress uniform. And um, I have a bit to go on it. September 5th, as I mentioned, was the date of her, her death. September 19th was the date um, of her memorial, her funeral mass. And, and so I was hoping to finish it for one of those dates and post it. But my goal now is to try and get it done before September's out because I am trying to, you know, stick with this and get them done. Um, as, as any of you who teach know, or any of you who are in school know, or any of you who are running a college know, um, <laughs> your time is not your own. Um, it, you, there are you know, ways that we have to prioritize time. So the creative work tends to take a bit of a backseat. And, and we also are in the process of moving into a new house at the moment. So um, we'll see, I, I'll keep you posted. And, and when I finish the collage, I will definitely share it with you. But so that's that's what I have to share today. I, I do have, um, the two books are with me in spirit. Um, I could talk about those very briefly. Technically I'm a young adult novelist, which I, I love that because it has the word young in, in my job title. Um, so, so as the beard gets whiter and whiter, I still get to call myself young. Um, I write what you could call 
um, gritty realistic fiction. And so my books also deal with topics that I think are important. The namesake is the story of a young man grappling in the aftermath of his father's suicide and trying to figure out his father's life. And he makes some very dark discoveries about what his dad went through as a boy. And in The Precious Dreadful, um, my, my social justice voice is speaking to me and to you through the precious dreadful and there are some of the issues of black lives mattering and and needing to say that again and again until people accept it um it also is the story of a young girl finding herself and um doing so through writing um so Anyway, if, if anyone is interested in the books or interested in learning any more about me, as Diana mentioned, I do have a website, which is woefully out of date. I don't think I've posted anything in probably two years on my website, but it'll all be new to you. So, so check it out if you have a chance. And there's an email connected with the website. I'm always happy to hear from, from folks and, and I try to you know write you back with a response. So Anyway, um, that's all I have for you. If there are questions, I would love to, to engage with, with folks. So thank you very much for your, your time and attention and the invitation to do this. Thank you. And thank you so very much um, for that touching and, and moving uh, tribute to all of those lives lost that uh, uh, us here at the Ostos family have also been uh, trying to do justice by um, through our own work. Uh, and I would like to kick off the questions, if I may, with one of my own. Um, I think I was mostly most impacted um, by the poem um, for Elijah McLean. And I'd like to ask you um, about that very interesting perspective you had um, for writing with the perspective of the shelter cats in mind. And so I wanted to ask you what, what inspiration you drew from to write for the cats and from the cat's perspective? That's a really interesting question. I, I think it just, you know, a lot of times with our writing, it's just a matter of it seems like the right thing. And I think with this one in particular, because I had seen so many images of him um, playing his violin and heard so much about that, you know, and maybe I only saw a couple of images of him with the violin in the shelter, but it stuck with me, you know, and, and it also, it felt like a, an opportunity to do something different with, with his poem, because that was such a unique aspect of who he was. And something that I am trying to capture is the person's life, the person's personality. Like with, with the poem for Ayana, um, I saw footage of her grandma, her, Myrtilla is her grandmother who was on the stand describing that night when her, her granddaughter was, was killed and the couch caught fire. And she was accused of grabbing the officer's gun when the officer came into the apartment. And there was no trace of DNA. There were none of her fingerprints on the gun. Um, but this story persisted. And on the stand, she, she as I think anyone would, break she broke down and and she was visibly very upset and she was accused of putting on a show and of performing and so that poem you know honoring all of the countless number of mothers grandmothers beloveds who have lost someone to 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 violence against black bodies going all the way back all the way all the way all the way back hundreds of years right but with elijah it was something so unique about him and I think it, it so speaks to the gentle soul that he must have been, that this was a gift that he could offer. And so I just, it, it just came to me, you know, and so many of my poems have been coming to me while I've been out walking. I haven't been walking as much lately because I fractured my foot while walking in August. And so I was in an orthopedic boot for about a month, but I'm out of the boot and I'm back to walking. So hopefully poems will come. But um, yeah, just, you know, I think that the innocence that Elijah seemed to embody and the innocence of animals seemed like a natural link for me too. And so I thought it would have been sort of too corny to really write in the voice of the cat. I'm not, um, you know, T.S. Eliot um, writing um, the cat poems, but um, 
Yeah, I guess I, hopefully that answers your question. Um, I, I noticed a question from a student of mine. And so that just makes me say, um, I hope I answered the question because my students will tell you I can ramble. <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> they have to direct me back, but, but you didn't actually answer what I asked you. Um, so <laughs> I hope- No, you did, you did a great job. And I, and I, okay. love the, I love the linkage between the innocence uh, of the young yeah. animals and it's lovely. It's really lovely. Um, I'd like to share with you before we go to our next question, a few of the comments that have been shared throughout your presentation. Thank you. We have Idelsa Mendez, who says that that was absolutely beautiful. And if I recall correctly, that was after your first poem. Thank uh, you. We have Professor Kathy Taylor, who says using disposable waste to highlight the humanity and dignity of people is profoundly powerful. Thank you, Kathy. I don't know if she's- Marino, Yeah. Marino Corniel says, Amazing way to make a point and to take a stand. Uh, and we have Melissa Q here who says, Professor Parlato, you are a remarkable human being for this. Your words genu genuinely speak and tell a story from your joyful student, Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. We have some wonderful emojis, some hearts and some thumbs up coming your way. And our next question is from Marino Corniel. And he says, this is a very heavy topic. Where do you find the strength to approach it? Thank you. That's that's a very insightful question, Marino. You know, I. It's interesting because even as I was talking about creating the collage of Elijah and saying, it's an emotional experience for me. Um, I also I hear in my own head this voice saying, you know. <laughs> the white person complaining about how difficult it is for me to go through the emotions of memorializing a black person who was murdered. My discomfort, my grief so is so inconsequential compared with that of, of those who are actually losing beloved members of their family, right? Um, so it is a heavy topic. And I think Marino, because of that, I feel really compelled to do it. Um, and earlier I mentioned, and President De Filippis mentioned, um, like witnessing my growth. And I have to refer back to the Tamarack and to re again, to refer to that particular student. And I'm going to use her name, um, Nicole Hayes, who sort of brought alive the social justice voice of the Tamarack. When Nicole was, was one of our staff writers um, and there were things, she is, she is a young woman of color and there were things that she saw from a perspective that I might not have caught, you know, because she was looking at life from a very different perspective. And, and as she helped me to recognize, I started to think, how did I ever miss this? How did I, from my place of privilege, and that's the answer, right? Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. This, this does, it, it gets me emotional um, talking about it. Um, how did I miss it? And how did I allow myself to remain silent even when I recognized it? Because we, we're guilty of that, right? Um, we, we recognize a wrong, we want to say something, but sometimes until someone else broaches the topic, we don't. And before the Tamarack, I was much more likely to be a quiet bystander. But there were things that happened throughout my tenure at the Tamarack, one of them, the 2016 election, which made it so that I, I could not remain silent. And I had to speak out when I saw wrong. Um, when, when our DACA students were threatened, how could we stand by and be silent? When you know any number of things happened, Nicole wrote a beautiful article about the Dakota pipeline. Um, how could we remain silent? And so I'm writing a, I'm writing a new novel now. And it, it began as a much lighter novel. It's, it's about a young man. It's kind of a ghost story. It takes place in a place very much like Cape May, New Jersey, which is one of our favorite places in the world. We honeymooned there. Um, and this bed and breakfast where this young man is uprooted and moved to to live with his great aunt, it happens to be the epicenter of all the ghosts in Cape May. So there are ghosts from every era. And it's, it's going to be a fun story to write, but I started to feel like, is that really my brand? to just write a fun story, or does it need to be about something? 
more important, more essential, you know? And so in researching Cape May a bit more, um, I learned that it was a center of the ab abolitionist movement that in fact, Harriet Tubman worked at one of the inns as a cook to raise funds for the Underground Railroad. Um, um, her, you know, her work with, with freeing people. And so I figured out how to link the two things. So, you know, I, I think that I'm teaching my young adult fiction class right now this semester. And a lot of the work that I assign has heavy topics, heavy themes, um, characters going through heavy stuff. And I just think it's important. It, it opens a door for us to have these conversations. It allows us to build compassion in readers and in one another and to find bridges where we might think there only should be walls. Um, so yes, it is sometimes very difficult, you know, and I think it's also another reason that I sometimes take months and months to complete a collage because I can't face going back to it. Um, and putting that last piece in for me is like a moment of finality. And I, I know that I'm going to move on to a next subject. And I don't know who all the subjects are. And we all know that I could, this series could be never ending. You know, if, if I had, I certainly have the, the household garbage to do a never ending series. You know, we all create so much junk, but I also, I, I feel like there are so many names that will never be known. And so part of what I'm doing is trying to, to get those names to be known in my own small way, so. Thank you, it's, uh, it's yeah. resonating I think with all of us, um, if I may speak on yeah. behalf of the audience, which is presently at uh, 40 individuals. Um, I'd, oh, wow. like to, I'd like to now invite in to uh, join um, the speakers portion um, for our Student Government Association president, Mr. Brian Carter, um, who would like to come in and say a few words. And as he joins, let me share a comment from our Dean Gomez, um, who says, Professor Parlato, your activism through the arts is very commendable as it has the longevity to transcend time and reach the masses from different cultures, religions, political affiliations, gender identity, age, etc. Although you didn't physically march during the Black Lives Matter movements, you are doing your part by silently voicing your position one artwork at a time and through your lectures. Thank you so much and keep speaking out in your own way. Oh, God, goodness, God bless you, Dean. And you know, when one of the goals of this series is that I am hoping to compile a book um, that with the poems and the images and any proceeds from that book, I would be able to donate to the cause. So maybe that could be the blurb on the back of this book. That was a beautiful statement about my work. I'm humbled by, by your words. Thank you. And now I'm going Great to meet myself so that Brian can speak. Please go ahead, President. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello and good afternoon to all of my host hosts, um, contemporaries on the behalf of SGA. It is my pleasure to give readings and help spotlight Valeros um, Hostianos in which we are here um, joined to help celebrate um, greatness within Hostos. As we approach the 183rd installment of his legacy, Eugenio Maria de Hostos has de dedicated his life to the existence of Hostos as he fought for education and self-empowerment through his life. As we continue to celebrate his, um, Hispanic Heritage Month, I appreciate the opportunity to recognize this wonderful human being who has not just given to myself, but every student and professor and faculty member an opportunity to become great. And for this reason alone, I would like to thank him. In life, all you need is an opportunity to become inspired by greatness. And we will continue to carry on tradition, being that he was iconic in the ways he represented for equal rights and strongly believed and understood that education is not a right, but a privilege. Um, so, so with that being said, I'm sorry. So with that being said, take, take on and take part of any positive opportunities that may come your way because this is what he will want you to do being that he was a revolutionary of education. So life is like a movie. See, life is like a movie. The stage is set and script has been placed and we are all stars in this cast playing a leading role in our own version of Hostos Community College. May our legacy be unlimited because greatness inspires the courage necessary to overcome any adversity that we may encounter. With that being said, 
I would like to thank the president's office and host host community college for inviting me to this platform. Thank you. Thank you, president. Thank you, well said. Uh, I'd now like to continue uh, back in the questions. We have one more for you, professor. Um, and it comes from Professor Lara Bonilla, who says, thank you so much for your reading. The pandemic has made us think about social justice as it relates to the body differently or more intently. How has it impacted the way you approach your writing and or your art, if it has? Absolutely. Um, before I answer, thank you, Brian, for, for your inspirational words. Um, I really appreciated those. Um, yes, the, the pandemic to me, um, that, that sense of isolation and the sense of watching some of the things happening in the world have, have really inspired my art um, and my writing. As I, I did mention earlier, um, the sabbatical time, um, which I don't know if I publicly thanked President De Filippis for that, but you know that she okayed the sabbatical, I, I truly appreciate. Um, and it gave me the opportunity to really focus on my own creative process. And that reminded me that as an artist and as a writer, my creative process is so integral to who I am. And that as a teacher, I sometimes forget that. And, and I, I let that fall away too easily. And so I've been making an effort, even as I am immersed in teaching, which is also a passion, obviously, and something that I love, to, to still try and create. Um, and I think also I've called this series of um, portraits and poems a calling. And I do feel that it is, it is some of the most important, certainly the most important visual work that I've created. You know, I've always been artistic. I always have, have painted, drawn, um, whatever. I've never done much with collage, um, but this work has purpose beyond just creating a pretty picture. And I think that the pandemic in a way is one of those things that reminded us all of what is important and of what is at stake in our own personal lives and in the greater life of the world, right? And, and our communities. And so if we can put the two things together, and I think we always should, I think that in, in creating, we need to be inspired by things that, that are important to us, that bother us, that we want to create change. Um, when those two things come together, it's a very powerful, um, result, you know, and so, yeah, the, the pandemic, the pandemic, um, I know we're all so ready for it to be over. Um, we, we personally lost a family member. Um, my, my wife's uncle passed away during the pandemic. Um, we've lost friends not related to the pandemic, but during the pandemic and not been able to come together as a community in the same way. So we're all experiencing literal and social death, you know, 24 seven. And one way that I think that we heal ourselves is by creating, you know, so that's become much more profoundly clear to me that creation is really what I'm here for. And, and that part of that is my teaching, you know, but there's also that huge part of me that that needs to stay dedicated to, you know, making books, making artwork, putting them together and getting them out in the world and, and really letting the chips fall where they may, because I, I often have really wonderful responses like the one that I'm looking at right now when I give a presentation, but I also, you know, go on Goodreads and look up one of my books and you'll see a one star review with someone saying like it was the worst piece of crap that they ever read. And <laughs> okay. That's fine. You know, we need to, as artists, embrace the work, create the work from within, and then put it out there and separate ourselves from it a little bit. But in ways, I don't think there's any way for me to separate myself from this series. They are not disposable. Um, yeah. That's tremendous, really tremendous. Um, and, and before I turn it over to our president to offer some closing remarks, I'd like to share just two more comments that you shared by our audience members. One is from Dina Daunt, who says, it's so interesting to hear about the process of art and craft and the role of art as action. Thank you. 
And the last one from Marino, who says, Steve, you are one of those human beings. And he invokes the dramatist um, Bertolt Brecht, um, a person that is definitely needed to make our world a better place by giving those oppressed and abused a voice. And I couldn't think of a better way to, to end our uh, um, audience participation section with that one. Seriously, to- Marino, I just have to say, um, when I make my way to the Bronx to visit Ostos, I, I have to meet you because <laughs> what a what a wonderful young person you are um, to to you know share such a profound um, bit of praise um, to for me. I, I'm really beyond touched, and I have to say, my my student um, Melissa, who who posted a comment, Melissa is in my drawing class, so we've known each other for a grand total of four weeks. We just had our fourth drawing class together yesterday, and she is my joyful student. I recognize that immediately. Um, so Melissa, you bring great joy to the classroom, and, and I so appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to spend extra time with me this week. <laughs> and, and to President DeFilippis and to Diana and to Victor behind the scenes, thank you for making this happen. I, I truly appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. And uh, before we formally close, I see uh, one of our audience members has their hand raised. Um, Indelsa, would you like to say something? I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, that was beautiful. And I, I would love to see that presentation in person with a big audience of students. And it was just an idea that came to my mind was while, I, while I was listening and, and looking at the artwork. Thank you so much, so very much, Adelsa. You, you, um, you know who to talk to to make that happen. <laughs> I'm certainly on board. When we're able to to meet in person, I would love to come and visit and and bring you know bring the work. So I, I truly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, President. The floor is yours. If you'd like to unmute. Well, first I have to recover from the afternoon, Steve. When you mentioned that violin, I thought I would just fall on the floor. The sense of loss, the silence, but it's not silent, the violin, because in a sense, the grief and the loss comes out in the work that you are doing, and that is so incredible. I also want to say how wonderful it is for you to hear, for me to hear you talk about what you learned from your student, because let me tell you, if teaching and learning happens in a very real way, and you know this, we're both learning all the time. Absolutely. The and the students, and that is clear. The engagement of the, of the Ostos family was phenomenal. I am so very grateful for everyone, for the care that you and the attention that you paid. President Carter, as always, you join us, and I know how busy things are for you, so thank you. I do wanna tell you that Ostos himself, reform education for women, and he was not a woman, all right? So I, I, I think you don't have to be anything other than a kindred spirit to support and to, and to educate and to move forward. And, uh, and what Professor Steve Parlato, Steve, uh, a very, very dear colleague, and you know, I'm an immigrant, so I carry you all on my back wherever I go. You do have a home here. And I was thinking, Steve, when you finish, Let's have a little exhibit here for a few days and let's have you come in person. Hopefully we'll be fine then. And we can have you give a, a real talk and tie it into the Black at uh, activities. You know, Kathy Taylor has been helping us with as well. This is amazing. It is amazing. Uh, and so thank you, thank you, thank you. And Idelsa Mendes is one of our former, she's an Ostos graduate who is now a development officer. She's already seen. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so, anyways, as always, Diana and Victor and everyone, the Ostos family turned up in a, in a generous way. And the MVCC family is here as well. And how sweet that your student actually joined. Yes. And Kathy was able to join. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. And, and I look forward to seeing you again. So, um, oh, yes, and we will, in, in a sense, we will be ordering some books, uh, uh, some of your books, so that our students can have access to it. Oh, thank you. If they come to see me, they will get a copy. Oh, how wonderful. I appreciate okay. it. 
Well, I'll, I'll have, to, I'll I'll have to sign them when I come. You know? All right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. All right. Thank you. Have a wonderful you. Rest, rest of the week, everyone. Thank you again. Thank you all so much for being here. And as always, thank you for participating and sharing in these events with us. Uh, we encourage you all to stay in touch and continue sharing your ideas and feedback with us. Thank you very much and take care.